Why is it that an increasing amount of individuals whom profess to be Christians are abiding by and promoting behaviors and concepts that run contrary to Christianity? Surely the typical Christian response will be repeating what Paul wrote to Timothy, that the Spirit expressly stated that in the end times some would depart from the faith. Although the answer is technically correct, it does not include in its equation the details as to the why as much as the result. Yet, it is not as if God's word does not provide the answer as to the why. Many believers forget to continue reading the subsequent words expressed by the Holy Spirit at the church's inception. It reads thus. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. 1 Timothy 4 verses 1 through 2. In Paul's second letter to Timothy, he also writes, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 through 4. What we have then is a manifestation of individuals whom detest biblical Christianity. Said persons now give their attention to and provide fame for individuals whom advance a secularized form of Christianity, devoid of its tenets, and calculatingly marginalizing the one who gives those doctrines. It shouldn't be strange, then, to the true Christian that many are seeking to create a neo-Christianity of sorts, one that is accepting of all the things that Christianity explicitly repudiates and condemns with equal alacrity and emphasis. Under this anthropocentric, man-centered, or humanistic Christianity, Allah is just another name for God. Hindu practices are acceptable, homosexuality and fornication are in line with God's design for creation, and truth accommodates itself to the whims and capriciousness of each individual. What never seems to dawn on those who embrace this newfangled faith is that if Christianity is everything, then it is nothing due to its lack of a unique identity. Yet, therein lies the craftiness of this trick. The only way modernist, secularized Christianity, if there is such a thing, can give way to everything and all that contradicts it is by distancing it from its founder, Jesus Christ. Since Christ himself gives Christianity its exclusive identity, those that desire to corrupt the faith must reform it by attacking Christ himself. John 14, 6, Galatians 1, 6 through 10. This occurs in the form of a multi-pronged assault on Jesus' historicity, the trustworthiness of the Gospels, which contain the narratives of his life, the reliability of the resurrection account, and a reinterpretation of Christ's message. Some will not even allude to Jesus when they promote the Christianity that is molded to their sinful image. It's obvious why. If they point back to Christ... Christ's words denounces them as charlatans. Others blatantly misrepresent Jesus' instructions. An example of this is the now common usage of Matthew 7, 1, Judge not that you be not judged. Consider the context wherein these words appear. Jesus condemns self-righteousness and sanctimony. However, decontextualized, suddenly Christ appears to teach that judging is somehow evil. It's ironic, though, considering how those that misuse the verse employ it to judge others' intentions. The people that pluck the verse out of its context do so in order to silence the rebukes of those who will point out that their behavior and ideas are sinful. Since the sinner hates conviction, he'll do anything to avoid it and censor it, even falsely attributing to Jesus a message he never propagated. Thus, we find ourselves in the midst of a generation that looks to remove any and all conviction that impedes them from wantonly sinning and will even alter Christianity to do it. Being that Christ rescues us from our sin while being in our sin, it is only natural to submit to our Redeemer and the faith he provides out of a sense of gratitude, accountability, and obligation. 2 Corinthians 5.15, Romans 8, 12-17. Yet such deference and obedience is unfathomable to the sinner who is characterized by pride and selfishness. 
Hence, he attempts to redefine Christianity and Christ by extension into a system that approves of his every immoral inclination. Christianity that is faithful to the biblical text is anathema to such persons. For this reason, reprobate ideas, such as the Bible needs to be modernized to fit the times, are crafted and promoted to give the impression that true Christianity and Jesus Christ are irrelevant. What is left is a faith that does not save, cannot transform, and implies that God conforms to everything that is evil. Considering the dire effects of abandoning Christianity as Christ would have us live it, it is necessary to resist the tide that influences many to reject the sound gospel. Although it is difficult, impossible odds have never been a detriment for faithful witnesses of Jesus Christ. Once a person has tasted liberty that comes exclusively from Christ, the only option left is to repeat and adopt Peter's assertion. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. John 6, 68-69 let us consistently examine ourselves to ensure that we are following the Christianity that flows from Christ alone and not a counterfeit faith created by our sinful imagination.